All right, hey guys, it's Hayley here going live with an amazing human being. We've just been chatting offline. Her name is Melissa Mitchell. Um, she is one heck of a human being. She's got a super talent that just blows blows my mind and it's going to blow yours too. She's worked on all sorts of different sets, including Lord of the Rings, bloody Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe, all over, like, I mean, I'm sure the list is endless. I've probably missed a gazillion, but they're the two that just kind of stuck in my mind. Um, and what she does is creates amazing special effects as a job. However, we're going to scratch beneath the surface with Melissa because you have an incredible background and it's, and you, and it's, Thank you so much for being so candid and so open because it can be a bit of a taboo subject to discuss. But I'm just going to lay it out there because it's how I am. I'm a bit of a one bam thank you man kind of a chick. <laughs> you 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 live with bipolar. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. And it, for me, it's um, it's not. I'm not bipolar. Um, it is part of um, who I am and part of my um, journey. And without it, um, I really wouldn't have been able to achieve half the stuff that I've been able to do because when you're in a little bit of a manic, you're awake for like almost 24 hours. So I've been able to do some amazing stuff in those times. <laughs> Mate, if you listen to all the, you know, like the, the ridiculously successful people in the world, they, they say like sleep is overrated. So I think that it comes with the creative side of it, right? So, you know, like, I mean, it, and things like that, obviously bipolar, ADHD, ADD, all these things, dyslexia, all these things that are put in this kind of like disability um, category, I actually view the opposite. And I feel like you maybe think the same way as me. It can absolutely be, it can be, it can be full on, but it can be your superpower and it can be just it's as good really as you can. Yeah. I think society needs to also change their way of looking at mental illness um, as such because um, what, what happens is um, we should be looking after our minds and um, when you're actually going through all this, it's, people should be supporting you and saying, you know, it's really healthy for you to go see someone, talk about it, and if you need some medication or something like that, don't worry about it, you know, because mental health, without mental health, um, then the physical health doesn't follow through. So that's when you start having all your addictions and um, you start getting angry and all those emotions sort of come up. So I think mental health is incredibly important and um, there shouldn't be any shame whatsoever um, around surrounding any of those um, sort of no. things. But do you think that maybe that's kind of like, well, we've grown up like in a society where it's been unfortunate, Melissa, because not a lot of people, you know, depression, and it's only now in, say, the last, say, five, ten years where people have started openly discussing it and not kind of carrying that shame that and it's ridiculous because you shouldn't actually feel shame, but it's just I think there's a lot of kind of negativity that comes with it. And, of course, I mean, like, I know that like, when I'm being ADHD and the girls in the office know when I am, when I'm on one, and they'll be like, you're very ADHD today. And I'm like, yes, I am. And it can be as much of a distraction as it can be helpful. So how do you manage the processes when, when you're in a manic episode? What happens? Well, for me, I these days I actually um, put it into um, something that's really um, positive and I will actually design, do a lot of design work, I will sculpt, I will paint. Um, it's, it's the best time to give me a script to do breakdown <laughs> and all that sort of stuff because, um, yeah, I get quite focused and, um, and I think that's the key is finding what you're really obsessed with about and really focusing in on that and I think that's where um, you know I've been able to hone in on um, my little skill which is close-up um, realistic special effects and that's just me years and years of just you know looking at it and recreating looking up um, websites that um, um, you know got their on it and um, autopsies and all those yep. sort of things, recreating um, those. So that's that's what I used to do in my um, <laughs> in my manics and that. And um, I would always educate myself, and um, I would always find myself learning um, mm -hmm. something all the time. 
So can I, I want to take it all the way back, like, you know, 10 years ago when you were a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'm going to back as a kid because I think that's really important because I, I'm assuming that somebody like yourself would have copped it as a kid and would have been put in maybe in the naughty basket or the crazy basket. Um, what was it like for you as a kid? Well, basically my, my mum said that I mostly graffitied her wound because I was born with a crown in my hand. And, and uh, I, I, was, I was always one of those arty kids. Like I would find anything to draw with. I was in trouble all the time because I was drawing on walls. <laughs> I was just drawing. And um, as part of punishment, like I never got, you know, like smacks or anything like that. My parents would just take my drawing implements away from me but um I was I was yeah I was kind of um arty let's just say arty <laughs> and that and arty. I you know <laughs> I had this manic um auburn coloured hair and um I was very tomboyish so I was always covered in mud barefooted and um running around literally with twigs in my hair and just I looked like a wildling, basically. How, how was it like at school? Did you have, like, uh, a good school life? Was school kind to you? Uh, you know what? I, got, I used to get really bullied when I was um, much younger and um, because I was quite eccentric and very different to um, all the other kids. And, um, and I've actually found that all my daughters are, have taken after me in that aspect <laughs> and that and and it's part of my creativity and I used to use my imagination a lot and um, I actually found that um, most of my friends were actually uh, foreign students because they kind of understood me and um, got the fact that I was a little kooky. <laughs> so it's different especially when you've kind of got groups um, when you're hanging out in groups, see uh, the the difference in the groups, in the micro groups, and the macro find each other. Yes, yeah. and that, and I I was very much into sport. I was very very good at sports. So when I got to um, college, um, I didn't really belong to any group, but everybody knew who I was because I'm just one of those people that I'll enter into a room and say, "Hey, I'm here. Hi, how you doing?" and just you know, yeah, one of the M. And, uh, um, and so everybody knew who I was, but I kind of kept myself. And you would most probably found me in where they were doing the shows where I'd be painting the backdrops. Or um, at the time, I wanted to actually be a um, builder. So you'd find me in the woodwork um, <laughs> um, room. You were a doer. <laughs> yeah. So I've always been one of those that um that's always worked with my hands and um you know and just created um that sort of stuff but um yeah no I was yeah I was a very interesting um eccentric child you've got a bit of a fan club happening off to the right here Melissa like Tracy's up there she's like Melissa had her first paid job at 12 is that right yes <laughs> I I was actually um um, hired to be a dresser for a fashion show and um, I, I'm just barely touching five foot four and um, <laughs> <laughs> you know my whole career has been working around really tall people and I'll tell you a story um, after this one um, and you know I was dressing the model and everything like that and her makeup artist hairdresser didn't turn up and um, and so I said to her, you know what, I'm, you know, I can do your makeup. I, you know, I'm here as a dresser. Where's your makeup? So she pulled out her makeup and um, all the hair products and I did a hair and makeup. And uh, um, anyway, this um, model actually featured on um, the front page of New Zealand Herald. And so that was my first um, public recognition of my... <laughs> makeup and um, hair and she went on to um, do quite well in the um, beauty um, pageants and, and stuff like that. 
<laughs> no, I'm actually, I'm, like, I know, I could, and I want to hear the second story, but, like, I've got um, three children and all of them are quite creative, one of which in particular is quite creative and, you know, like the, the one. And so I'm actually going to play this interview back for her because it's so wonderful to kind of hear about someone that's been able to go on and actually use their superpower and, and recognise it. And I don't know if you necessarily recognised it so early on in, in your earlier years. I don't know if you did. Did you? Um, not really. Like, um, I was, I was kind of oblivious to the fact that you could actually do this as a career. Um, yeah. My parents wanted me to have a real job and because uh, and um, art doesn't pay and um, and to really get my head out of the clouds. And because um, my mum is, you know, she used to work for Revlon as, um, and she used to measure out all the, um, you know, the makeup and the chemicals and everything like that. So that's how I had an introduction to makeup was um, her bringing home these big bags of um, makeup. And I was about eight. So anyone that came into the house got a makeover or a haircut. So I wasn't as sharp as I am now with hair cutting, so everyone up with the makeovers. <laughs> So I, I, I'm literally, and the only I'm so fascinated is because literally my daughter did my makeup and she does all these cool like rainbow things. She's only 12 and yeah. literally she like does all these rainbow eye things, but she's she's obsessed. She loves it. And, but she doesn't necessarily want to do it on herself. She does it on herself, but she loves doing it on other people. So, well, this is, this is it. Like for me, art doesn't mean that it's one dimensional, it's three dimensional and you um, can sort of bring something alive um, by creativity and um, the, you know, the use of art. And um, so when I actually found out that, um, you know, you could actually make this into a career, I've, I've never been so excited in all my life. Yeah, that, <laughs> well, interesting enough, um, I do. Do you know Pat Armstead? Yeah, yeah. We went to makeup school together. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Um, I started off as a um, nail technician, and um, you know, and that's how I I met Pat because I um, and you know, I always take everything to extremes. I've never done. I'm either all in check or all out check. And um, so when I started up my nail business, um, I had 100 bucks, spent 80 on polish and um, $20, I think, on um, nail files. And um, that's how I started up my nail business and um, eventually become award winning in um, nails and, and all that sort of stuff and ended up selling my business for quite a good profit. <laughs> and that, so, um, I, I sort of found myself in a um, hairdressing um, salon and yeah. um, this one particular week I couldn't pay the rent so I offered to wash hair and then discovered, ooh, I really like doing this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I went and trained as a hairdresser and um, graduated and um, and kind of worked in a salon for a little bit but I didn't enjoy it as much so... Um, and I thought, nah, I can do better than this. So that's how I got to uh, makeup school. And um, I was telling Pat about it, and this is what I was going to do. And that's how we both ended up at um, makeup school. And, um, yeah, so we, we graduated. And I, I kind of went straight into TVNZ and Lord of the Rings and, and all those um, sort Incredible. of things. So, I mean, you just brushed over that. You're just like, oh, you know, Lord of the Rings. And, you know, it's like, What? That's, that's like a dream for like any makeup artists that are out there. Like that is next level dream. Like how did you land that job? Well, um, basically, yeah. well, I, I kind of did okay in makeup school, so I came um, with high recommendation. And that, but I, when I was at makeup school, I sort of discovered special effects, and I really. I really enjoyed that more than, say, like doing um, the, the makeup, you know, what we call, um, you know, everyday sort of makeup or glamour makeup or photographic and, and that. But not to say that I can't do that because I've 
I've had um, my work published all around the world and that. And um, But my passion was um, special effects. And I found myself when I was on set kind of migrating more to the special effects side of things and getting to yeah. know everybody on there. But it was kind of like a closed club because it was very male-dominated. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and it because this is like you know late 90s and um and I was like hang on I want to be part of this club how do I become you know like part of this club and that and I got talking to quite a few people and and what have you and um they said well you need to really study if you want to really get in here and do this then you really need to study so um I I got talking to people and this um, particular, you know, um, person was sort of like, nah, you need to, you know, you can't even be on my team. You need to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, person a man? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, excuse me, sort of thing. So I ended up, yeah, well, <laughs> the thing is you never tell me no. <laughs> because that's when you know, my sheer determination kind of kicks in. And I was like, well, dang it, I'm going to go and learn how to be a special effects artist. So that's what I did. And um, I, you know, I was told I had to do this assignment and um, I had to do some history on uh, special effects and I had to do some form of sculpture and and all that sort of stuff. And um, anyway, I did all this. You know, and it was a real thick little assignment. I was very proud of it. And the guy that was telling me that I had to um, learn how to be a special effects artist walks out. He's my teacher. (laughs) It's it's a bit of a joke. He thought he would make me do this assignment and um, do a sculpture just to also see how skillful I was because I was so adamant that I was good enough. Wow. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and um, so I graduated from uh, special effects school with honours and um, went straight on to Lion the Witch. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, don't, you want my, don't want you on my team. They're like, uh, can we be on your team? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but the thing that I found was I had to be better than everyone else. I had to be five steps ahead of everybody else um, because, you know, it, it was because I was female and, you know, to boot, I was, I was small and, you know, short and, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, who, who's, who's this little <laughs> little chick, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And um, I remember the first day on... Um, uh, Line the Witch, they, we were put into teams and, um, you know, I was put into Team Minotaur, you know, again, you know, um, as a bit of a joke for Melissa because, um, like I said, you know, I keep referring to my height because the um, the Minotaurs were the shortest was six foot six yeah. and the tallest was seven foot two. <laughs> And I had to dress these guys in their suits and yeah. get their heads on and carry all these heads. Like I would carry up to six heads and they were animatronic and they were really super heavy. So I used to bundle them together and carry them behind me like this. And this particular day, um, the seven foot two guy and that um, got they had these special gloves. And what happens is that they're really super tight. So you had to sort of stand there like this and the person had to shove their hand down into the glove. So as they're shoving the hands down, you've got to pull up. And then, and I thought I was ready. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he went to shove his hand down. I went to push up and I found myself flat on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking, what the heck just happened? Oh, my God. And this guy just picks me up like a rag doll and I'm, he's got me in front of his face and he's like, you're right. And I was, put me down right now. 
<laughs> was so indignant. <laughs> you're like the legs kicking down the bottom. <laughs> I was so indignant that I'd been picked up like a child. Oh, no. <laughs> that, that, that never happened to me ever again. <laughs> so I learned um, how to stand it? properly to yeah, be able to. You had a lot of men, didn't you? There was a lot of, like, male domination. And was it, like, yeah. cop a lot of flack? Because it's okay. I mean, look, the thing is, being in a male-dominated industry isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's how it's the behaviours and it's how they conduct themselves in that male-dominated uh, environment. Because I know heaps of people that work in male-dominated industries, but they have a fun time because the men are respectful and there's no drama and it's okay. Uh, yeah. Was it always like that for you? Did you get a lot of respect or a lot of pushback? What was it like? Well, see, the very first time I realised about sexism in um, industries was when I actually went to job interviews as a builder because I wanted to do an apprenticeship as a builder or a mechanic. And I got laughed out. Nobody would give me the time of day or anything like that. So when I decided that I was going to get into this business, you know, I was, I was actually really quite scared about the fact that I'm going to get you know, <laughs> booted out, I'm going to get overlooked and um, just, you know, treated very differently. And at first I was, and, um, you know, they kind of patted me on the head like, so it's one of the things I really hate is when people pat me on the head. <laughs> so, you know, they kind of pat me on the head and, and kind of pat me on the back and moved me along and, and all that. So. It was when I went, hey, no, I'm just as serious about this business as you are. And, you know, God damn it, I'm actually as good as you, if not better. Thanks, so yeah. move your ass over, I'm coming in sort of thing. And when I actually got my big girl pants on and actually went, no, nope, you know, I'm, I'm getting in there. And I did. I rolled my damn sleeves up. I got in there and I did exactly the same thing as everybody else was doing. And um, I was lifting heavy things, I was running about, I was doing everything that um, was required of me. And if not more, because, you know, I'm a girl and I need to <laughs> show that I'm, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And um, so I got, I got a lot of respect in, um, in that way, that I, you know, they kind of looked at me in the end like a little sister. And, um, you know, and they, they never tried, like, I'd, I'd have one or two that would try to sexually harass me. And, um, but they, yeah, but they got put um, in their place very, very um, quick because um, I'm quite quick-witted. And yeah. um, I will actually, you know, <laughs> slice you in two uh, with quick now, wits. Was that peers or just kind of like... Clients, what was that? Was it just, or was it just people? That was um, some of the the um, boys that I used to work with and, and stuff like that. And but yeah. once they realised that, you know, I'm here to work. I'm not interested in you, and that yeah. I just want to do my job. You know, yeah. bugger off. And that, um, you know, um, that's when, you know, things were very different for me. But I, mean, I had really. That's part of Sorry. it. And it's part of it. It's not part of it because it's never, it's not like, oh, it should never be accepted as normal. But the reality of life is it's everywhere and it's in every industry. And I think just taking a leaf out of your book and actually making it abundantly clear, standing up for yourself and pushing back is a really great way to kind of, you know, distract or diffuse or whatever have you. But not, not to take anything away from anybody that's, um, you know, obviously suffered next level which is crazy and I'm glad that that hasn't happened to you now with no. that yeah so like I want to talk off camera we were talking you've actually you're you're a warrior I would describe you as an absolute warrior because you've been through there's certain things obviously with bipolar and it's not and, and I love how you say that you are you're not bipolar you have bipolar is that that's yeah. a quite description yeah but I'm quite sure with those types of things you go through stuff and you have self-doubt creep in, and then, you know, you self-medicate. What's that been like for you? Well, 
before I was actually diagnosed with bipolar, um, I, I didn't really understand what was really going on for me. And um, I used to self-medicate with um, alcohol and um, I actually, um, my drinking kind of got out of um, control and um, it really interfered with me mentally, physically. Can I have, just sorry to interrupt there, because you know, because so many people have different limits around alcohol. Um, and what you would view as out of control and what somebody else would view as out of control. What, what do you mean by out of control? What kind of things, how are you behaving with alcohol? Um, basically, um, I couldn't function without alcohol. Um, I would get up in the morning and, you know, like my routine before going to bed was um, have a skull of um, some whiskey and a chase it down with some Barocca so that I don't wake up with too much of a hangover. And yep. I would get out of bed and um, first thing I'd do is have a drink of vodka and that, you know, because, you know, that's what helps with um, your hangover and, and all that sort of stuff. So it was, um, yeah, so basically I didn't really function without it. And I used to walk around with a bottle, but it was filled with like vodka and lemonade and, <laughs> and, and stuff like that, you know, and um, it. I, I felt shame that I was doing this and um, and I was like, I couldn't figure out why I needed it and why, and you know, but I actually found out that this was masking a whole lot of pain and anger and a whole lot of other issues that had gone on in my life and that, which is another, st another story altogether. Um, you know, so I was masking all that. And then um, it was after my first daughter was born that things got a little crazy and um, I didn't know what was going on and I had all these really bad thoughts that I wanted to kill myself. I uh, wanted to, you know, just get rid of everything in my life. And um, at this point I was actually cutting my um, arms and everything like that because the pain that I felt, I just couldn't really describe it. So when I went to the doctor and got assessed that um, I actually had um, bipolar, it gave me a, so, a certain amount of relief because now I had a name for it, but it still didn't help with the pain that I was feeling. And it yeah. was only when um, I was almost homeless, um, I, I'd reached my brink for alcoholism and um, I was literally going to a church um, one day a week just to, to eat because I didn't have enough food to feed both me and my daughter at the time. And that, that um, you know, I took a real hard look at myself and decided that, you know, this can't keep going. And I went and um, sought help and, um, and basically went to counselling. And the day that I decided that I was going to turn my life around, I went home two sackfuls of um, bottles with, you know, filled with bottles. I, I pulled out of my house and that, and I had a two-bedroom house wow. <laughs> at the time. So even when I actually moved out of that house, I still found bottles and that. So give you an idea on, you know, on where I was at that time. And um, except for one instant that, I had last year, which I'm still kicking my own ass for, I hadn't drunk anything for about 16 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Mate, I'm yeah. Goosebumps. Covered in goosebumps. Thank you so much for being <laughs> so honest. Because and this is what it is. I mean, like, there's no point, and everybody's aware of kind of like alcoholism and, you know, and quite often addictions are linked to mental health, underlying mental health. So, and it's nice when you hear somebody like yourself say there is there are solutions and there is help out there, no matter how bad things get, that there is always up. How did you, what was your up? What, I know that you obviously, you had a defining moment for you. How did you get the help that you needed and what was the help? Well, for me, I was really super blessed that I have the most amazing best friend in the entire world. And she actually said, Lisa, you know, you're, you're an amazing person. Um, I can see it in you. You just don't see it in yourself right now. And you need help. And um, 
it was the first time someone was actually really honest with me in that. And she, you know, she was like, come on, girl, let's, let's do this. So without her love and support, hey, Corey, um, you know, um, basically I, I would have been delayed, let's just say, in that. So without that support and her coming with me to counselling sessions um, and, you know, ringing me every day just to, you know, just, you know, talk crap, really. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. but it took my mind off things and, and what have you. So for me, that was... So for you, you know, it's counselling and is it medication as well? Do you take medication as well? I started on lithium and that, but it really um, took away my creativity and part, you know, most of who I am is um, is creative. And without my outlet for creating, um, that's a part of who I really am. So, um, you know what I did? I kept a diary for two years of what made me happy, what made me sad, and um, and that's how I've stayed off lithium for almost twenty years. Um, and no medication is actually finding what I'm obsessed, obsessed with and what makes me happy and being creative yeah. and being yeah, around and amazing people. So, and the freedom to do it. Oh, my God, I'm literally covered head to toe in goosebumps because uh, people say, like, I've got to be on medication, and that is actually a common thing that you hear. Like, yeah. you know, all of a sudden they're on these medications that make them feel numb, and it numbs them, and then they – the very essence of their superpower, which is the good side of it. And this is what we talked yeah. about earlier, that bipolar, ADHD, all those types of things, they can have two very opposite sides to them and there's good yeah. and bad. And I think that's it's the ability, but just because you live with bipolar doesn't mean that you can't be in the middle. You can't you no. can be in the middle and reach from both sides. Exactly. And I, I just feel medication actually really blocks um, your gifts and yeah. and who you are meant to be and um, why you're put here on earth. And um, there's a lot of numb people walking around at the moment because um, society has told them that they need to be medicated and that yeah. to stop harming themselves and, and oh, stuff like that. Reach into the fire. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I've got I've got a nine-year-old daughter and she cops it at the moment because she's got pink hair and there's a lot of people in society going off with the comment that you just made that are very judgmental and have a set way and it's kind of like I'm thankful now at the moment people are actually starting to celebrate creatives and all the rest of it because it's starting to be, you know, viewed as just as important as academics. So I think yeah. that when you don't fit in those boxes and you don't tick those boxes and you need a square peg in the round hole, um, it can be quite difficult. And then you do find yourself medicating or trying to fit in or whatever have you, which which just manifests. See, the thing with me is, um, and what I've always kept close to me, is to always be your authentic self. Do not change. Do not waver from um, your little quirks, and because that's what makes you um, you. That's what makes you interesting. This is what makes you create things. Is to be your authentic self. And um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to um, be anyone other than myself. And, and if that makes you uncomfortable, then you know maybe it's it's you. It's, it's actually not me. <laughs> Yeah, or we don't have to, that's okay. Like, and you can literally say, if it does make you uncomfortable, that's okay, we don't have to share space. Yeah, exactly. And I allow other people to be who they are and um, and I've learned a lot from um, other people that actually live within their authenticity as, as well. And to be able mm -hmm. to be a creative, you have to live in that authenticity and you have to be really honest with yourself and you have to be honest with everyone around you because that's that's how we create and that's how we, you know, we find our strength. This is how we tell our stories and we convey them and um, and without our lessons and without the hurdles that we've gone through, um, you know, basically we don't have a story and human nature is 
all about storytelling. It's all about sharing our stories and um, helping people to be inspired and to grow and and all those sort of um, things. So for me, it's... Do you think that maybe that's what is wrong with the world? (laughs) Is that we've become far too system, far too systematic and far too um, one size fits all that it's created realistically this... um, kind of one big normal club, if you will. Yeah, you know, because um, even my middle daughter at the moment, she's ADHD and she she's like a mother. She's a triangle trying to fit into a circle society and it, it doesn't work for her. So um, I keep saying to her, just be yourself, yeah. you know. Um, if you want to have as many piercings as you want, you know, we just stop at the tongue thing, but um, that's 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 up to you. And when you're old enough, because she wants to be tattooed just like mum and everything like that, you know, I said, when you are old enough to make those decisions, then I'll take you to a really good tattooist and, you know, we'll, we'll get that done, you know. But yeah. I will never, ever stop my children from um, expressing themselves in a creative way. Um my youngest is also an artist and she draws and she's been around um, creativity all her life. And my eldest daughter is um, a beauty therapist and she does she does amazing stuff as well. You know, so it's I've taught my girls to embrace their quirks, their creativity, um, their, you know, who they are and um, make no um, excuses or say sorry for who who they are and that, and just get out there in the world and the right people will actually gravitate to you and um, the ones that don't gel with your vibe kind of just, you know, wither off into the corner and they go off into their own tribes. <laughs> they can do what they want, yeah. And this is it. Oh, my God, I'm covered in goosebumps. You actually made me tear up there for a minute. I'm like, don't cry, don't cry. It's quite (laughs) literally my nine-year-old. I am going to show this to my um, youngest, my nine-year-old. She will literally, sorry, can you, sorry. (sighs) God, there's people walking to my studio. I'm just like, for God's sake, close the door. But she's nine (laughs) years old, and she's actually honestly copying it at the moment on social media because like I don't like and there's people like saying things like you know she's going to get tattoos and piercings and she's going to be a lawbreaker and I'm like you know to those people I say I hope so I hope so I hope she does exactly what it is that sets her sets her on fire Melissa thank you so much for being so honest so raw so real so um authentic but actually authentic not just that cool marketing thing um I would love to have you back on here because I think that your whole energy, your whole vibe and everything that you stand for is doesn't just inspire young people. It's it can literally inspire anyone that's actually going through similar situations. Like similar situations. Chick, I think you rock. You're amazing. You're our people and this is why we started Obsessed. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> See, you later. See you again soon, hey. Thank <laughs> you.